burning a bunch of fossil fuels from now on takes us well above two, as we've seen from these major assessments. Contrary to the contrarian myth that the Earth has, Earth temperature has stabilized since 1998. 1998 was a, was a big El Nino year. And during El Nino years, the, the heat comes out of the ocean. And so we measure it in our land surface records. And what do you know, we've been keeping thermometers on land all this time, because that's where we live. If we were dolphins, I'm sure we'd have thermometers underwater with us, but we don't. So the long records we have are for land surfaces. So it appears that since 1998, the temperature has stabilized at the global level. It appears that way, 1998 remains high for the highest temperature year in planetary history. All 13 of the other warmest, 14 warmest records have come in this millennium. So 13 of the 14 have come in this millennium, the other one was 1998. Where's the heat been going? We know it's been heating up, it's been going into the ocean. Look at 1998. Right there next to 2000, just, just the left side of 2000. See what happens to the temperature in the ocean? It skyrockets, especially in the shallow ocean. The light blue figure on top. The ocean has a lot of heat. It's like a battery. It's been soaking up all that heat this time. It looks like we're on track for an El Nino event later this year, this, as early as this fall. And when that happens, a whole bunch of that heat is going to come out of the ocean, and we're going to set a record within the next couple of years for land surface temperature records as well. I promise it's going to blow away 1998, because there's a lot more heat in the ocean now than there was in 1998. There are 30 self-reinforcing feedback loops that are irreversible at temporal spans relevant to the human experience. Ultimately, they are reversed, or Earth would have gone Venus a long time ago. But they have been reversed in the past over many, many hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years. And those temporal spans aren't relevant to persistence of humans on the planet. So, methane hydrates or clathrates were bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean as reported in science about four years ago. <clears throat> hydrates or clathrates are small cages around methane molecule CH4. And as the clathrate warms, as the cage warms, it breaks off. The, the bonds break off, and the methane is released directly into the water and then directly into the atmosphere. So I'm going to talk about the first of these for quite a while because we know the most about it. It's been studied, it's, it's, it's a great fear. James Hansen wrote about it in his book, Storms of My Grandchildren. Firing the clathrate gun is about the worst possible thing we could do to ourselves. And so it was reported in Science in March 2010, the methane in the Arctic Ocean alone is equivalent to 1,000 to 10,000 gigatons of carbon relative to the 226 gigatons we burn in fossil fuels as of March 2010. Since then, of course, we've burned a bunch more, so we're up over 300 gigatons of fossil fuel carbon burn. But still, we're talking about 3 to 30 times the amount of carbon equivalent being kicked up into the atmosphere as a result of methane. As reported about a year, a couple of months after that original paper in Science, a minor increase in temperature is sufficient to trigger methane release. And it appears that we've done so. From paper a couple years later, a suite of amplifying feedback mechanisms such as massive methane leaks from the subsea Arctic Ocean have engaged. Finally, years later, there's recognition in the scientific community that self-reinforcing feedback loops have been triggered. To explain a self-reinforcing feedback loop, when you kick a, kick a soccer ball on a soccer field, it rolls to a stop relatively quickly because the friction from the grass and gravity causes it to slow and then stop. A self-reinforcing feedback loop is a loop that feeds on itself. So that's kicking the soccer ball over a hill, over a cliff. And initially, at least, the further it goes, the faster it goes, the faster it goes, the more rapidly it descends. According to the authors of a paper that appeared in Nature in July 2013, a 50 gigaton burp of methane is highly possible at any time. At any time. That's equivalent to more than 1,000 gigatons of carbon. It can be released literally at any time. 
NASA observed methane plumes up to 150 kilometers across that same month in the Arctic Ocean. So imagine you're in a, in, a, in a ship in the Arctic Ocean, and as far as you can see in every direction, it looks like ginger ale. The ocean is bubbling. And don't breathe. Because that methane is bad for you. According to an analysis by Sam Carana, again, not in the Referee Journal literature, the global average temperature of more than 4 C above baseline is expected by 2030 and more than 10 C by 2040. Also from Malcolm Light, not in the Referee Journal literature, from just a few months ago, the Gulf Stream transport rate started the methane hydrate gun firing in the Arctic in 2007, when the energy per year exceeded 10 million times the amount of energy per year necessary to dissociate subsea Arctic methane hydrates. So it appears based on extensive evidence from the Referee Journal literature and not that we have fired the class rate gun. And this is what Karana's analysis looks like with the number two line, the pink line on the left, representing runaway warming. Albert Bartlett, longtime professor and then professor emeritus at Colorado University, pointed out in in the thousands of times he gave a presentation on the exponential function, that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Because we see linearly. We look back at what has happened in our lives, and we've seen relatively innocuous change in almost everything. And we project that forward. Look, technology keeps getting better. Temperatures changed a little bit. When I speak on college campuses, frequently nobody in the room except me has experienced a normal Earth because they were all born after February 1985, as were some of the people in the room here. You've only experienced a warmed Earth because we haven't had a global average month, global average temperature below average since February 1985. You've experienced a warmed planet, and you think it's normal because that's where normalcy bias takes us. This is what we experience, this is what we'll always experience. We don't deal well with the exponential function, even though we see it everywhere. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that curve looks just like this. Human population growth, that curve looks just like this. The amount of pollution in the ocean looks just like this. But we can't really grok that on sort of a day-to-day -day basis. We don't go into the grocery store from one week to the next and see an exponential change, right? We go in one time and the bread aisle is one aisle. We don't go in the next time and bread is in the whole store. <laughs> well, it's a bread store now. What happened to the strawberry jam? So we don't we don't see, we don't we don't account for that in our linear driven lives. So what methane concentration globally looked like as of about a month and a half ago, dark red means more methane. You can see the methane in the northern hemisphere almost completely, even though there's methane being released from Antarctica now too. And you see it over land as well as over the sea. And I'll talk shortly about that self-reinforcing feedback loop. That's, per that's permafrost. As the permafrost breaks down, it releases methane into the atmosphere. And so you can see it's getting really hot, or there's getting to be a lot of methane, and therefore potential for a lot of heating, in the boreal forest in North America and Europe and Asia. So that was the one self-reinforcing feedback loop produ produced by the Referee Journal literature in 2010. Four more in 2011. The first of those is Atlantic water shooting through the Fram Strait off the north and east coast of Greenland, taking warm Atlantic water straight up into the Arctic. This is an excellent demonstration of how those self-reinforcing feedback loops don't just feed within themselves. They feed among themselves, too. So as more methane is released in the Arctic Ocean, it gets warmer which causes more methane clap rates to rise to the surface, which causes more methane to be released, which makes it warmer. And so you see that downward spiral. Tack onto that warm Atlantic water shooting up into the Arctic. So now we have the Arctic 20 degrees warmer than it was in just two or three years ago. Because we have that warm water going up there. And so now these feedbacks are influencing each other. They're feeding off each other. We have warm water going up there, releasing methane clap rates. Methane clathrates rise, release methane into the atmosphere that causes the Atlantic water to be warmer, and so on.